Um, so yeah, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Carlos. This is uh, Proto Book Lab uh, from protobooklab.com. Uh, we meet once a month uh, to discuss a product related book. Uh, we often have the, the author joining us. And yeah, today we're going to discuss managing product equal managing tension with uh, Mark, which Mark is also uh, with us on the call. So yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mark. And maybe we can start with uh, yourself giving a quick intro about you, about, about the book. And then, yeah, as, as usual, it's open like, for questions or comments from, from everyone. Of course. No, thank you, first of all, for having me, Carlos. Really appreciate it. And it's great to talk about the book, but more importantly, get your thoughts if you've read it um, as well. Just a very brief intro about me is uh, that I've been in product management for about nine years. Didn't start out that way. I used to be um, a corporate lawyer back in my native Amsterdam. I'm now based in London. I've worked in a number of companies, both with startups. Um, I think, Mark, you are muted now. I got a message saying that the host muted me. Oh. Is there a sign like... Okay, okay. sorry. <laughs> is that like, the intro is too long, we're born... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, sorry. <laughs> author, are we... This is not the book we're discussing. <laughs> okay, so let me just continue. I was just talking about how, from a product management perspective, I've uh, worked at a number of companies, startups, more established companies, obviously started very much at the bottom, if you want to call it that, but you know, just as a junior product person, uh, making things up because I really didn't have a clue coming from professional services, uh, but always worked cross-functionally, so working very closely with engineers, with designers. And I found that the last few years, um, because I'm also, I should mention, I'm a part of Mind the Product, I uh, already heard a few of you talking about some of the events that we've done, whether it's the conferences or the local product tank meetups. And one thing that really struck me and still strikes me at times is that we talk a lot about the kind of hard skills involved in managing and developing products. So we talk about how to do a roadmap or how to run a successful design sprint or you know, how to engage with customers. And, and that's all great stuff, don't get me wrong, but I felt, and when I spoke to my peers, um, in maybe less kind of public settings, you know, water coolers or having a drink in the pub where they would talk about the difficulty of the kind of softer side of uh, product management, the difficulties involved in some of the trade-off decisions that we have to make. Dealing with people can be difficult. Uh, people dealing with us can be equally difficult. And, and I thought I need to do something with this because I feel that a lot. I've learned a lot of lessons as you'll see in the book, hard lessons about the tensions that are inherent in product and, and where those tensions come from. Um, and the idea for the book actually started after I'd done a few talks about this topic. So um, it was a talk, it's a talk I do where I talk about the, uh, the frustrations of being a product manager. And I thought, I'm gonna try this um, a few uh -huh. years. And I thought, Maybe people hate it because they were hoping for something on roadmaps. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk about my frustrations. Very honest talk, uh, probably uh, where I was really honest about the mistakes I've made and my feelings and all the rest of But I was so amazed about the number of people that came to me after the talk, and I've had it repeat a few times, uh -huh. too, where they said, oh, so excited that you're bringing this up, and I've had similar situations, and what would you do? And again, that prompted me to, to write the book. Okay, nice. Yeah, yeah. I, when I first uh, found it, that's also the, the first thing that I thought, you know, that I think most of the books related to product money that, that I always see like recommended or, you know, that people talk about are indeed like templates of how do you do roadmap or, yeah, design sprints, etc. right? And I think this is that, yeah, the, the only one I, I saw that goes more into that uh, soft part, like you said, right? Like with, with tension. Um, so by, by reading it, there was a lot of things that indeed res resonated with me, right? And that, uh, well, not with me only, but like talking with all colleagues, right? I think probably that's uh, one of the nice things that you end up talking when you meet other product uh, people that, you know, they're all like, okay, yes, we all have the same struggles. So we all, uh, <laughs> and I think that's like the, that the goal that you find on those discussions that then they share like how they can, um, try to solve them or, or you know, tackle them. So 
Yeah, no, I really like the book. I, I also felt it like quite personal, right? The thing you share in the, you know, you like hip hop and box. And uh, I think also sharing all those, uh, yeah, hard earned lessons. Uh, I, I really enjoy it. So yeah, no, I think, yeah, th thanks for writing it. Um, is there someone that would like to start sharing any uh, questions or maybe takeaways uh, with Mark? And yeah, just, you know, if, if someone wants to, to participate, yeah, just anytime it's good, just feel free not to interrupt. Just make sure not to interrupt someone and then yeah, just say your name at the, at the beginning. Um, Julia, do you want I'll to start? Go, you like. Yeah, I'll go. Um, so I'm Julia Shadett. Um, my um, sort of title, if you like, is Product Doctor. So uh -huh. that's how you'd find me, Product Doctor. Um, my question is actually a, more of a technical one. How the hell do you have so many references and you know, how do you actually pull all this material together? And how do you organize your thoughts? Because you have so much, you have the personal experiences and the stories, right? Then you've got all the tools and techniques and okay, we kind of have our own little list of those and, and you've got a lot of them obviously in your toolkit book. So I kind of get that bit, but, and, and your own stories and that that's kind of cool, but all the, um, sort of references to other people's experience and the big brands and small brands and all the stories that you put in there, along with all the um, uh, sort of citing all the reference points. I mean, there's so much in there. And I'm just really interested to know how you organise it. And maybe that's not just about writing the book, but in your own kind of product management practice and as you coach your, your teams. Yeah. Um, Have you been asked that before? No, I haven't. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, I haven't. It's, you know, I love you for that question, uh, Julia. The other participants in the call, Julia and I know each other really well. Uh, but I hadn't seen this question coming. And, and just for context, um, yes, I wrote a, my, my first book that was, I've got it here conveniently. That was very much, and I wrote that about three years ago, very much focused on those kind of hard skills, like lots of frameworks. Um, and, and particularly with that book, a lot of that work is, is, is already done. What I did, you know, lots of smart people have already applied those frameworks, dedicated books to them. But even there, I really tried to uh, overlay with my own stories of what I found working well with some of these tools and what I didn't. Because the one thing I maybe should have mentioned in, in, in the intro as well, that I'm a, still an active product management pr practitioner. I work at ASOS. London-based uh, e-commerce company. I've got a team of about 16, one, six people, product owners, product designers. So I'm still very much, you know, in the trenches, I would say. And particularly in my second book, to answer your question, uh, Julia, is I really wanted to tell my story. But at the same time, I didn't want to make it just about me because who wants to read that, right? But I, I did want to put those personal bits in to A, show you like this is real. I'm living yeah. this, working on this every day. Um, also wanted to, to, to show the reader, like, I don't have all the answers, but I can at least share my experience and give you some practical tools and techniques. And what I did with this book uh, as well is interview people, like a lot of our peers in product management roles, again, big and small companies, to hear their, their, their stories, their tips, because like you were saying before, Carlos, I find that uh, when you put a bunch of product people together, and especially if you feel a bit lonely as a product person, which you can be, especially if you work on a smaller setup and you don't have a whole product function, you might be thinking, why is this all happening to me? But then you're yeah. <laughs> down with Phil, or you're talking to Tim, or, or you're talking to Dorota, and they say, yeah, I've had the same challenge, and this is how I go about it. So again, that's the reason why I put the, um, the, the stories from other people in there. And to your point, Julia, yes, I'm a bit of a nerd, but we established that in a way where I do like to really, you know, do a bit of research, really learn from other people. I don't know, I, I blog and I have been blogging for about um, 11 years now. Um, that was one of my tickets into the world of product management originally. Um, so I have a lot of the links and the kind of information there because I, I, I really, the way I 
think about these kind of stories is I wanted to be blend. I wanted to blend of my own stories, um, people, other people working in this space, but also some research and really good thinking that has been done around this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that also reminded me, I think the other thing that I really liked from the book and that I also found refreshing, if you want to say, was, you know, I think all the other books that I read, they're always referencing, you know, the Silicon Valley companies or Facebook, Google. And this one I really liked when there were stories from, from other companies, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I also really like that part. Um, is there someone else that would like to make another question or, or share? Yeah, I think Mark is also very interested in, in, in seeing what everyone thinks or like opinions from the book. I think Phil has got a question or a comment. Yeah, I, th I did actually. Um, so my, my question's about, so you were saying you're active. Um, did you feel it was, it's quite candid where you talk about like swearing at people and losing your cool in the office and stuff. <laughs> did you, did you, uh, like, how did you approach that? How do you feel about that? Um, I did think about it. Um, I did ask my wife, like, should I write about these things? But my gut was always uh, that I should write about these things. And I talk about these things quite openly. Uh, and the reason why I'm doing it, because I don't know any other way, I might as well just be honest and open about it. Um, because I particularly didn't want to, it to be a book where I'm just saying, look at me, I'm the holy grail. I've got it all figured out. Because I find with product, particularly what we do, there's so much uncertainty, so many new circumstances. Look at how we're living today, right? It's really hard to say this is the blueprint for how you should be a product person or how you even should, you know, should manage relationships. So that's one. Um, and I think the other thing why I'm quite candid about it to, to answer your question, Phil, is that I do feel that I've learned and that and the way I've learned is some of the techniques and the things that I include in the book. Um, so, you know, I'm not just saying I was a, I, I don't know if I can swear on this. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I wouldn't, Julia says yes. Um, no, but, you know, I was a dick, uh, but at least I've learned from it and I'm trying to become better. And this is what I've learned and this is what I've applied. So for instance, that, that, example that you're bringing up phil uh but where i do lose my call where i get my lose my call in a, in a major way you know i've learned and i don't always get it right trust me but to pause you just and i talk about that in the book quite a lot as a technique to take a step back in the moment you can feel a trigger being triggered by someone saying something or something happening but just literally it doesn't have to be something ma magical but just take a moment to just breathe and and again it might sound super simple but it's been a lifesaver for me because if i hadn't i'd probably be out of a job never been seen in a product management kind of role again thank you that um i i just wanted to say that was probably the biggest standout for me in your book was that candid approach because often um like the toolkit you're given that toolkit but it's from a holier than thou approach where it's like yeah, but I've never needed to use that toolkit. Um, so it was quite nice to have that. And I think the, um, yeah, I think I think it's really nice to see that view. And then uh, Carlos touched on it at the start where um, I think sometimes we go into a software product management bubble and we forget that there's like lessons we can learn from boxing or from other disciplines or from other companies or other industries that apply to things that we feel and do within software product management. Yeah, I, I think that's so true. I think particularly product management, a lot of it is about storytelling, right? That's what we yeah. do a lot of. The, uh, and, you know, that's why I always look for analogies because, again, I find that a really good way, as you say, Phil, to get things across, to look at where the parallels with other disciplines or other areas of life. Absolutely. Can I ask someone a question? Whoever wants to speak up, uh, could be Phil, could be someone else. Which of the tensions, if you've read the book or at least had a, resonated with you the most that you thought yeah that's real for me in my current role or my current company and i can remind you of some of the tensions i talk about in the book if that helps i mean i've i've i i'll go in with one which is uh as, as you probably know mark uh, uh, so i my boss is friends with mark so everyone you're always one degree away from mark in product <laughs> <laughs> um but um we're current, I'm currently in a fashion retailer, having left booking and a lot of the guys on the call. Um, 
and we're told all the time look at asos so mark's in the holy grail world at the minute and i'm in new look which is a, a smaller fashion company i'd argue asos are a, a digital company who do fashion <laughs> whereas we're a, we're an old school fashion retailer who are trying to do digital um, but I'm constantly told, look at this amazing thing ASOS have done. Look at this cool thing ASOS do. So that external factors piece was really interesting because mm. it does make me introspect and go, actually, yeah, I should be more introspective. But yeah, that's there, there's one for me. I'll shut up now and let someone else talk. Mm. Yeah, I've got, I've got one. Yeah, James. Hey, how are you going? I'm good. How are you? Good to not, not too bad. Um, I'm just outside. Um, I, I, I think, well, we've, we've chatted or and actually you were one of our first um, guests on our AMAs that we do at work about um, at work and bring that um, external factors in because yeah like you were saying before around you know you do get in a bubble of your company and and get obsessed with like day-to-day -day stuff but bringing um, outside and thinking really helps um, I've been doing like a monthly AMA with people at work bringing different companies to kind of talk about their experiences and usually having themes around things that we're trying to manage one at the moment is how we bring digital um, marketing teams on board with the digital way of thinking and how we can align more of our OKRs so that we have a better working relationship. And that was a massive tension for us. I haven't read your book though, but I will. <laughs> but I'm imagining that might be one of them. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's definitely, I've got, you know, just to, to, to come back on that, we've got a number of tensions. So the one that Phil described was around, you know, I, I call it keeping up with the Joneses tension where you're always looking at where the grass is greener and, you know, it's good to be focused on competitors or non-competitors, but equally I've worked in companies where, you know, whatever the competitor does, we need to copy and the thinking goes out of the window kind of thing. So that's one tension. I talk about, uh, I think what uh, James was referring to that kind of goal setting and the kind of tension around priorities like C-suite wants this, we on the ground or the customer wants this. How do you deal with that tension? I talk uh, about the tension of just the, 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 net, the nature of the products that we work on. So with software, I find it really interesting. That's obviously very, and I'm not an engineer, but it's very binary, right? If you look at uh -huh true or false and suddenly you get people involved and you start thinking about creative solutions but you will get to the point where literally the computer says no how do you deal with that tension uh, the other thing which i talk about in the book uh is is i call it the knitting spaghetti tension where you know when I think about creativity, I think about something that is not linear, that is just creativity can come from anywhere, we can all have ideas. But it's interesting when you work in environments where people are looking for certainty and, you know, a linear path, and suddenly you want yeah. to into a process where it's not as linear, it's not as predictable, how do you deal with that? So those are some of the tensions I cover in the book. Um, I've got another one that you didn't mention, actually, and it really resonated with me because I didn't really think about it this way which is collaboration mm. and the, the problems with collaboration that I never thought it might be a problem because I was like, oh, collaboration is fantastic. You know, in product, <laughs> we want to collaborate with everyone and everyone should be super excited about it. And then you're talking about the, 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 the competitiveness um, about collaboration when we have to like collaborate with different teams. And I'm in that situation with my team now because we changed the structure of our teams a little bit. And there is a team that does very similar thing, but on different platforms and we're doing similar thing on different platforms. So really interesting to see, you know, how it shapes the dynamic between these two teams. So we're supposed to be collaborating, but also we sort of competing. So trying to find that um, sort of healthy balance uh, and that healthy way um, and the healthy level of tension is interesting in this situation. But yeah, I'm, I'm happy you talked about it because I would never think about it as something that might be negative. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm starting to notice the little things <laughs> and thinking, like, oh, how can I tackle that? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's interesting because I do find, that, you know, and I was talking to someone about it uh, today, you know, that kind of almost that co collaboration blind spot, you know, the idea mm -hmm. of put people in a group. And we expect them to work together, or in your case, Dorota, where you say we've got two teams, we expect them to achieve a, a shared goal without really thinking about, the, you know, the norming and storming. Uh, people might feel threatened, for instance, when they're suddenly put together, or as you say, have to 
compete for 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 prioritization but i do think and, and again that suggests that the book that's not necessarily a bad thing unless you but as long as you find a way to really channel and have those conversations in a constructive way it's yeah and i think like the shared goal is sort of the, the key thing i think for us at least yeah and i think that is just that shared goal and that clarity and really talking that through and then i know it sounds obvious but you'll be amazed how many companies, big or small, struggle even to get to proper, what I see as proper goals, and then let alone being able to communicate them properly to people who are expected to, to execute or to achieve those goals. So yeah, that's that's another good one. Yeah, the, the other one I found personally is I think you also talk about like, you know, building versus learning, and then also get, um, like innovation versus keeping the lights on, right? And I, yeah, I really felt how it can be that uh, present, you know, like when I was in London, I worked in a startup, so it was more like build or die, so the decision was easier, right? We need to build and ship something, whereas you're in a, sometimes in a bigger company and you have more space and more resources and more time, if you, you will, so you can, you know, invest more time on learning more. Um, and indeed, how do you find that balance, right? And then I think you also talk of the... Um, the, the balance act, right? Like if you invest too much time in learning, maybe you will go to market too late. If you spend, too, uh, you build too soon, then maybe you build something that no one wants, right? And then I thought like, so then I can find the balance that works best for, for me, right? But related to collaboration that was being mentioned, then I thought maybe the balance for everyone is going to be different, right? Like some people will want to explore a bit more and do more research and check more data, right? Where others might be like, we just build something, right? And at the end, you know, you need to sort of like get everyone on the same page on like what the balance is for the team, I think, not only for, for yourself, right? Yeah. But, but that's exactly going through that process. And, you know, that's that classic norming, storming, forming kind yeah. of we don't always invest the time to really understand what the diff who the different individuals on your team are. You think, oh, I'm going to, I've taken a leaf out of Spotify's book. We're going to assemble a squad. Uh, yeah. Humor, Oliver, Julia, they'll be, you know, Dorita, they'll all work together basically and they'll be fine without really taking the, you know, understanding is what are their personalities, what are their backgrounds, what are the desires, you know, and, and bringing and going through that process, and it is a process, and it's pure. It's not yeah. product management, in it, or it's got everything to do with product management, but it's really about people. And we often, because we've got all these pressures, we don't go through that process, uh, and we think, yeah, we'll be fine, and we'll work out, let them deliver stuff, and we'll push them a bit, and be good. But you know, longer term, it might work for a release, great, yeah, but longer term, it's not sustainable, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Is there someone else that would like to share some comments or question? Hi. I was, I, yeah. Hey, uh, hi, I'm Ksenia, um, and I have uh, I have some comments. Um, like for for me, somehow the the beginning of the book about, was like where Mark talks about uh, the tensions. I I cannot. Like I, I always come back like, what was that tension again? Why, why, why does it have this name? And I'm like, I don't know why, but I'm very confused there somehow. <laughs> and the, but the, the rest of the book were, um, it's kind of more action points and like, what can you do about those things? I enjoyed it a lot, especially the, the one about uh, leaning into the tension collaboratively. So that's uh, uh, like, yeah, how do you, how do you um, go about creating more collaboration within the team? So that, that was awesome. Um, I was thinking um, like some webinar I attended a couple of, or last year or something like that, um, related to product management was talking about how product manager uh, in a lot of com companies is the point of connection of different information flows. And that uh, brings like a lot of uh, pressure and kind of like it's a burden that you have where you like your information passer, your connector. And I don't think that, uh, Mark, you talk about this in your book. Did, do you experience this? And like, did you consider this, like adding something like that? Or maybe I missed something. No, 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 it's cool. So two things. First of all, personal offer. If you want to uh, connect with me afterwards, I'm going to take you through all the different tensions <laughs> and explain the keeping up with the Joneses, the knitting spaghettis. If you're 
more than happy to. We'll make it, we'll turn it into a virtual coffee. Uh, second thing is, yes, I do talk about it much more in the context of how do you deal with the information flows, but also with the people that are involved in all those different information flows. Because that still for me is the, the biggest thing is that um, I think the, the, chat, the tension is that with these information flows and with these people is that we don't have that kind of transparency. So I talk a lot about transparency of information mm -hmm. and how to your point, Tenya, is that it shouldn't be resting on a single person. But I find so many companies where they claim to be transparent or you know they're trying to be, but they're really struggling. And in that situation, you get one person who's got information, but then the stakeholders got information and it gets lost in translation. So one of the things I try to do as a product person is really democratize and be as transparent as possible, even just for the simple reason that otherwise I'll just, you know, get into trouble and forget who I told what and why and how. So just one single truth. And that sounds simple, but particularly if you're in the middle of all those information streams, it's really hard because it's much easier sometimes to say, you know what, I'm not going to worry about how I'm going to share. I'm just, whenever it comes, I'll, I'll share it around. But you need to think about, you know, how do I really make that information much more accessible? Cool. I have one more thing. Kind of, uh, okay, so just wanted to ask, why do you have the, like, the say, the managing product managing tension, like on, uh, on both of the pages? Like you could use maybe the, um, like the, for the chapter title or something like that. Uh, so you know where you are in the book, do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, that, that's, uh, you could ask the publisher and the editor, no. Uh, <laughs> just, you know, just a reminder that which book you're reading. No, we just decided <laughs> to do it that way. <laughs> chapter headings. I'm actually quite pleased with how, how we've broken it down, but obviously I'm biased and I spend too much time with that book. But Yeah, you know, I'm thinking about, um, uh, what is it? Uh, don't make me think. Uh, like you, you want to know where you are, and it's like, oh yeah, I'm reading the book. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, I don't know which chapter. Or uh, like, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, but but I think the other thing is with the book as well is that you know I've, some books really lend themselves to that kind of way because they've got a very clear structure and it's all, mm -hmm. it's not that kind of book. If mm -hmm. that makes sometimes you have a model and you can say I'm now in part one of that model and then I'm part two. This is a bit more again. It, it's a bit more fluid again, in the spirit of the book and the topic that I'm trying to cover. That makes sense. Cool, thank you. No worries. Any other thoughts? Who, who feels that, you know, that they don't need to read a book about managing tension because they, they've been in product or they've worked with people and, 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 and products long enough to know how to best deal with that tension? Or they've come a long way. You don't have to be an. I think it's a lifelong journey, right? Like <laughs> you have some things you face, right? But is anyone who feels like no, forget about whether they've got the headings at the top of the page or not. I don't need to read that book because I've got this. I've come a long way, and yes, as Xenia says, is I'll continue learning. But I've come a long way, and I've I've got a bit much better handle on it than I used to. I had a thought like this when I started reading this book. I'll be honest. Uh, but the more I read it, actually, you know, there's like, it's slightly different outcomes. So you, you know most of these things, right? But it, it just helps you to organize it in slightly different way or like change the way of thinking about slightly different problems. Mm -hmm. um, so I quite appreciate that. I didn't finish yet. So there might be some other things that I like or dislike. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it just helped me to like change the way of thinking about these specific tensions or like locate them even you know, within the work I'm doing. But yeah, I had this initial thought that, oh, actually, it's, you know, stuff that I know already. And yeah. you know, again, that's the first thing I would say. I'm not, you know, and I think I made that clear even in the intro to the book. I'm not claiming to have all the answers or writing something which is like rocket science or that no one else could have written clearly. But I do think, you know, it's really, I personally really wanted to write this book because it's I want to talk about it. I want to talk about it from a personal perspective. And even if you think, yeah, I know this, I've had really good feedback uh, for what it's worth. And people said, I knew some of this stuff, but it was such a powerful reminder. And it made me think a bit more about how I can do more of it or forgotten about some of these things that you talk about. So even that makes, yeah. me, makes me happy and gives me satisfaction. I feel like it, yeah. the, a big benefit is that it's explicit. Mm. 
I think what 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 I've often experienced is wondering, you know, what's where is this coming from? Is is there a different in difference in personality, a difference in culture that we're approaching this in, in a different way? Is there misunderstanding or, or disconnect because I have a particular role and someone doesn't think that that's my role or, you know, product is very misunderstood. But, you know, even the title of the book is like, oh, that's what it is, is that this job is full of managing tension that I don't know if I would have been able to really say that that's the problem, but I, I, I do think that's, that's the problem. <laughs> It is. If you think about, you know, the, the, the trade off decisions that we as product people have to make on a daily basis because we have constraints, you know, just again, the very nature of what we do as product people, those decisions that we need to make, you know, to your point, Julie, that's that's full of tension. Forget about the, all the other things and the, you know, the different titles that I, I gave them those tensions, just, you know, that we have to constantly navigate between. Do we have enough people? Do we have clarity about the cost? Do we have time? What has to give, right? Can I release the full scope or do I go for MVP? Those kind of simple things, which you don't necessarily think about because you do on a daily basis, that can be full of tension, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's easy as well to uh, go back to the fixed mindset that you're talking about, where it's easy to go, I'll do product when I get more resources or when the company gets behind me or when my hippos listen to me or it, it's very easy to externalize the tension and not manage it yourself but just go when that's sorted i'll be good yeah and it's also what i've seen and i've been at you know close to where you just because you can't manage it and even just man i talk in a book about managing yourself before you can manage the external tensions wherever they come from it might be easy if you don't do that at some point in your career that you just give up on product as a discipline and that sounds really dramatic but because to julie's point because so much tension of it doesn't go away whether you're a vp of product or a junior product manager if you don't find a way to at least accept it or deal with it or have some techniques in place you know, it's, 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 it's a tricky job to, to, to continue doing, I would say. It's really yeah. interesting. I mean, I, I tend to sort of, I tend to, to see things as processes. And yeah. so, you know, when I'm looking through the book, I'm thinking, okay, so, all right, you've just given me some labels. So I can actually call that out and say, that's that. And that's that. Okay, so what do I then do with it? Right, here are some tools. Okay, so I'm going to be really open about what this is. I'm going to discuss it with people and say, this is what's happening here. So it's that whole kind of, you know, I'm an alcoholic. I'm not, but you know what I mean? You know, it's, it's standing up and saying it and putting a, a label on it. And it's knowing that, you know, someone else said it right? This isn't just me. I didn't make this up. Oh, this is a known thing. This guy's written about it in his book. Do you know what I mean? And it's happened. It happens all over. So it's common. You know, you're not on your own. This is something that happens. And now you have ways to deal with it. And it, it's like Julie was saying as well, you have to kind of call it out and recognize it before you can know what to do about it. Um, and I think it's really interesting the way you point out the tension at so many different levels you know is it is it tension with the state i mean you got that, that there's a picture you had that stayed in my mind where you had the customer at the table and the stakeholder at the table and the investor at the table and everyone wanted different things you know it's that sort <laughs> of you know notion um and so i think that's the value it has even if you feel you know oh god you know i'm, I'm old I've, I've done this before i've been here i've been there i've done it it doesn't mean you can't kind of find new uh i'm going to use, use the word nomenclature because it makes me happy and i'm probably pronounced it wrong but there you go <laughs> new um labels for things you know that you know exist that you've experienced that then springboard you into ways to solve it because that's what it's about isn't it yeah and i think you know having conversations like these that's exactly the reason why i w wanted to write the book again not because i wanted to win a pulitzer prize uh, that wasn't the objective, but really enabling people to have those conversations, as you say, Julia, just to be open about it, again, to reach out to people within their teams, outside their teams, because it's not something that people necessarily, you know, because they, maybe because they feel a bit uncomfortable, or as you say, they don't have the, the, label, uh, the labels or the terminology or the thinking about it, to have a conversation to say, Carlos, I'm really struggling because... 
we're just trying to keep up with the Joneses here uh, and we're copying our competitor and my ideas don't get any air time or cover. What do I do about that tension? That's a conversation Carlos and I could have. Phil? Yeah, there was, um, there was a, there's all, it's almost a new tension that you've brought me through your book, but the story that's resonated most with me was um, when you talked about um, a CEO pestering you at 3 a.m. with something. So I've literally had three emails from my CCO over the last two weekends about a certain issue on our app. Um, and so that resonated with me. But um, what, what resonated was actually a new tension because you talked about, um, I suppose, because we've got all these tensions, the really easy thing to do is um, to, it's the classic product manager thing of, I'll put that on my backlog. Ha ha ha. It's on the backlog. You feel happy. I know it will never get done. Um, but you actually then brought in a new tension because you you realized that where you'd written someone off, the CAO asking for something at 3 a.m., actually they were right. Which And then that made me rethink my current situation where I've just got into a norm of certain stakeholders. I just filter them out almost. And then I shouldn't be doing that, actually. I should be engaging with it. And But that's, that's the thing, right? It's very easy. We've all been there. And I'm not saying I'll never be there again, to be super honest with you. But it's very easy to say, oh, that stakeholder been in my ear for the last five times this month already. I'm just too much, you know, to Xenia's point, too much information coming in. I'm going to block that because it didn't go anywhere. Um, but again, you know, the, the word empathy, there's a risk of overusing that. But that for me is really empathy, like understanding where the other person is coming from. Doesn't mean that you have to be best friends or make them happy. That's not our role, but really understanding where is that request at 3 a.m. or 6 p.m., whatever it is, where is it coming from? Why are they so persistent? Why are they upset that they're not getting what they were hoping for? Um, and again, I'll be super honest with you. I try to remind myself of that kind of empathy and that active listening every single day. And I'm cross with myself if I don't get it right and equally I have a minor victory in my head when I do get it right and at least take the time to just listen, but really listen. Maybe, maybe related to that of like allocating time and things. I, and, um, you know, a, a lot of the tensions like, like the other said, but I think I recognize them. It also helped me that now like they are categorized and you give some um, ways of how to, to tackle them, right? And, and one that I honestly haven't practiced before, but now like got me curious, like, okay, maybe I start doing this is the, uh, the self-reflection, right? And I think you we also give the example of uh, allocating at least one hour per week to you know, just write down the, what were the highlights, lowlights, what did I learn? Um, so I was curious to hear as well from, from the others, like, mm. this, you know, do, do you do it? Uh, has others found it useful? Uh, because, yeah, I personally, maybe I do it more like um, unstructured, right? I, I guess from time to time, I, of course, think, like, what did I learn? What were the highlights, and et cetera? But, yeah, I, I, I didn't do it like as a structure as I think you, you suggest in that book. So yeah, I was curious to see if the others also practice this or maybe something similar. Anyone? There's no right or wrong. I'm you know, like you, Carlos, I'm curious. Oliver. I think I think you have to be you have to be willing to be very vulnerable um, to to emit those sorts of things, but it takes a level of um, maturity, I think, to sit down and write what are the things I'm really struggling with in these relationships or the tensions I'm getting, and probably even to sit and have a chat. I, I definitely had, did with my 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 new manager that I had. We just didn't understand each other, and I had to reflect why isn't it going well, and I had to you know just have an open conversation, just say look this is what I'm noticing, you know, is this the same for you? Like, just put it out on the table. And I think only good stuff can come from that. Thanks for sharing, James. Mm. Is there anyone else? Because I'm curious. Yeah, Xenia. I usually, like, it, it, if you have a problem, then you would try to fix it, right? So then you, you reflect. And I like that you have this kind of more regular check-ins. And the other thing that I love that you put in was about the nonviolent communication. I think that's the super powerful tool. And when you see like how it changes the communication, uh, like when people go from kind of like blaming each other into the more uh, NVC uh, type of communication, it's super nice. 
yeah no absolutely i think yeah communication that's a big thing for me also cultural um you know i whenever i start a new job i have like a little guide which says working with me an introduction which i don't mean as an excuse yeah. to say i'm gonna be a dick but at least i'm warning you about it beforehand but it it says things like you know i'm from the netherlands i live in israel i'm quite direct um you know just giving people that background i i take feedback really well but as long as you decouple it from me as a person for instance so i already give people that context which also helps with 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 communications for instance right so people understand a bit more so that's that's one tip which which is helpful but I'm curious because obviously we talk about problem solving, but I think that self-reflection piece, because I've I'm curious if you find time, and again, it doesn't have to be an hour or meditating for two hours a day, because I find particularly in our jobs, we go a million miles an hour. And sometimes I feel rightly or wrongly almost becomes a bit of a batch of honor of showing off how busy you are and working really hard to get release over the line. And aren't we fantastic and courageous and committed and all the rest of it? he is has learned or is good or maybe isn't good yet in terms of finding a moment to just breathe and reflect on what happened this week what they learned again there might not have been any issues let's be clear who 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 finds the time to do that or not or would like to or it's one of those things that i know i know would benefit me I know it would benefit me loads, but I, it just it's that discipline of actually working smarter, not harder, having that mm. moment of reflection and focus to then do the right thing rather than just spin loads of plates and keep things going whilst in an absolute storm of things. I, I really struggle. Yeah, no, I, you know, I think you're right, Oliver. There is some discipline, but equally, I'm, the way I look at it, and again, I don't get it, right all the time but at least even after something has happened or had a difficult day or had a difficult moment uh with a, with a certain tension that i take a moment to to write it down that works for me particularly and i write about that in the book but that's just me but just to think what happened here or you know and again what i'm learning as a result of that that I can even do it in the moment so i talk in the book as phil was referring to quite openly about I was probably one of the biggest bulldozers uh, you've ever seen, right? Leaving, <laughs> right about in the book, trembling um, and shaking and stuff. And and again, I'm still not getting it right. I think also partly because I can be quite direct and people think, really, he's a dick. I'm not, I'm not, but you know, it's happened. But taking that, you know, being able to reflect even in a moment. And again, I come back to the pause to say, okay, what's happening here? Why is that person upset or why do they want that why am i thinking of dismissing them but do you see what i mean it's already saved me from a lot of trouble over the years um so it doesn't have to be the point i'm making is that whole kind of reflection doesn't have to be a whole you know it's nice if you can do it and you have the time for it but it doesn't have to be a whole profound endless kind of thing i think it's very cliched but it's um it's under tension personally that i find out more about myself when I'm in that those tense situations or managing tension, that the more revealing moments, and they're the ones you reflect back on more, going, "Why did I do that?" or react that way. And and uh, generally, how good or are you, have you found been finding yourself in terms of when you've done those reflections to make sure that you learn from it or do something different, like you would do with any kind of problem solving that you, you know, like Xenia was saying, because that for me is another trick, right? It's one thing to be aware that's that's half of the battle in my experience but then you want to think about okay how can i make sure that doesn't happen again or i learn from this or i do something different next time it happens uh personally i try and uh respond rather than react that's my like my my, my mantra in my head is like my instinct is always it, i used to be called red phil like red ross on friends where he gets really angry um and so I was known probably similar to you, Mark. That's why it's so refreshing reading about you swearing <laughs> and stuff. Because uh, I think if you're passionate about your product, which we all will be, we're all like invested in our products, in our teams. So when it goes wrong or when it's not happening, you, it's frustrating. Um, but yeah, not reacting, responding rather than reacting for me is the key. 
And, and what do you see also maybe for the benefit for everyone on the call? What's the difference? What's the nuance there? Respond versus react. It's, it's exactly what you talked about, which is uh, taking the moment. So my instinct, it's either my animal instinct or my having processed it for a little while. And you talked about the, is it 10, 10, 10? Or is it? Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh. Like yeah. 10, is it 10 days, 10 months and 10 years? And actually, if I think about anything that stressed me out about product, in 10 years time will not be stressing me out. It's like the health of my kids and my wife and stuff that will be stressing me out then. Not nothing to do with product, no matter how stressed I am today. Yeah, like I said, it's, it feels like a super simple technique for in case you haven't come across this technique or you haven't read the book, but it's literally, as, as Phil says, it's asking yourself the questions, how much am I gonna care about this in let's say 10 minutes, 10 months, 10 years? And it's exactly as Phil says, it just helps with that perspective, especially in the moment to at least take the first thing out of, of the situation, whatever it is. Yeah, and, and, and I found also maybe similar, like more related to the previous question you, you asked about, like, you know, who, who has got money intention. Uh, and the book that I also really like was um, you know, suggesting people to also just em embrace the tension and also accepting that we don't know and it's okay to say, I don't know, right? Because uh, I think, yeah, that moment where I started, you know, being very honest uh, with everyone and saying like, oh, I don't know this one. Uh, that, that I think helped me alleviate a lot of that tension, you know, because I think if you start doing the opposite, like, like you give on the example, right? Like, uh, oh, do this or trying to communicate that image that you do know everything, it's, you know, it's like you just go down the rabbit hole, right? Uh, yeah. Then you need to keep up with that image. You, what happens if what you said you knew doesn't end up, you know, correct? Um, so yeah, reading that part of like, how do you, that it's okay to say, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I, I found really, uh, really appealed to me because I, I've also experienced it personally. Um, but f f with that one, I, I had a, yeah, like a question also to see what, what others think, because I think saying, I don't know, and then having the others also saying, that's okay, right? Uh, might be also very linked to the uh, culture from the company, right? And um, because, you know, you might start saying, I don't know, but then your boss comes like, but you should know, right? You're the product manager or... Uh, if you just say, I don't know, and you want to share the, the failure because you think, I mean, of course, there are some learnings, right? But everyone is like, no, why, why, you know, why this is not go well, et cetera, et cetera. I think at some point you can also say like, mm, okay, maybe next time we say, I know, right? <laughs> so how do you get like the, the whole culture, I think, or, or the company, right? To be well, more aligned with this. Yeah. Should we just maybe from people that we haven't heard from before, I would love to exactly as you say, Carlos, because it's one thing to me, for me to write in the book about being honest about that and saying that you don't know, or let me look into it. But how, how many people feel that they can do it or have learned to do that or struggle to do it? Love to... If someone wants to jump in that we haven't heard before, that'd be fantastic and feels comfortable sharing because I'm curious. I'll share. Hi, Alana speaking. I, 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 by the way, I didn't read the book. I'm intrigued, but I'll try <laughs> to do my best. <laughs> I will probably write your questions later. But yeah, in this situation, it reminds me pretty much the advice people give to the teachers, right? So when the, the student asks a teacher a question and the teacher doesn't know, uh, normally teachers think like, okay, I need to answer. Otherwise it's like, I mean, they will think I'm not in the, the control and stuff, but the best answer suggested is actually, yeah, like let me <clears throat> step back, take a moment, say, okay, I'll, I'll look it up and actually act on it. So later you get this information, you get back to the student and this is the best way you can do it. And I think it's pretty much working in this situation as well, because uh, uh, in a lot of like this high pressure situations, so you'll be like, uh, yeah, I would like to do the like, correct measurement or answer like how to do it right away on the stop put. But uh, most of the time you don't know enough. And it's, uh, it's like, it, it, sometimes it's hard, but you still like the best way you can do it is just like, uh, just be honest about it. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll do it later. I don't have all the information. Happened to me recently with, um, we started to do more estimations in certain tasks. And that would happen randomly. So you will be asked on the spot to, to kind of uh, estimate something even roughly. 
and you're looking at the big bulk of work and you're like, yeah, that's great. I mean, let me look into it and I'll get back to you. This is all I can do at this moment because there's, there's not enough time for this to, like, to be done even in a bulk. So uh, yeah, I, I totally agree on this, like breeze and <laughs> take a moment <laughs> off. And another personal technique, and I'm thinking it's like, uh, um, just for another topic, sorry, I'm the, a bit of top of the year, but about the reflection, self-reflection. The good mm. thing is like, I, I do like uh, the practice of brain drops and I'm thinking more and more to do it for like work-wise. So kind of when you are especially like thinking creatively or trying to figure out certain tasks, just drop it all, leave it there, get back to it on the next working day. Because sometimes I feel like things are in my head for like all the weekend and it's there until it's done and it's like a while. So yes, it's, that's my personal take and take on that. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks for sharing. I think Julia, you did you also want to add to to that about you know saying that you don't know? Or... Yeah. So I'm I'm a scientist by training, and so is our CEO. And um, you know, part of that is is knowing how to make decisions on unlimited data, and. One thing I've started doing more lately is really stating the assumptions. So in more of a hypothesis way of, well, if X matters more, then da 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 da, da. So in this, the example that you gave Elena of, how do I estimate how much time something's gonna take if I don't actually know what it entails? Well, I know that most of the time we need some backend work. So if we need backend work, that's probably X hours. If we need front end work, it's this. If we have to go to design, it's gonna take that. So I've, I've tried to be really upfront about like what assumptions are made because you have to make assumptions across the board, right? And I think that's such a good shout, Julie, because I think assumptions are for me, in essence, a smart way. And it, we all do it, right? Of saying, yeah. oh, no, or this is what I think, or this is what I believe. You'll be amazed when you see these amazing business cases, great numbers and you dig a little bit deeper and it's all based on assumptions. So we might as well be honest about that and say, this is what we believe. We're gonna be smart about how we're gonna test those assumptions, how we're gonna mitigate the risk of those assumptions, not you know, um, materializing. But yeah, I think that's, that's one way, again, especially if you feel a bit uncomfortable saying, I don't know, I'm thinking that people might think you're stupid or not on top of it. That's a really good way of framing it, absolutely. Anyone else, I'm curious, that I haven't heard before, who's like, yeah, I'm happy to be vulnerable, saying that you don't know, or asking for help is another thing I talk about in the book, which I think is really important for us as product people. Um, so just something to share from my side. Um, I'm not the product manager, but I'm considering to move to that space. So for me, it was really enlightening to see what type of tensions there are and how uh, experienced experts can handle them. Uh, so just thank you for that. And um, yeah, for the questions you ask. <laughs> so yeah, I don't really have anything to share um, at that side. Thank you. I hope, you know, the book or me didn't put you off from one <laughs> main concern at the moment. <laughs> Not yet, no. <laughs> again, maybe I, I know where I'm conscious of time, but I am curious because again, like someone mentioned before, I do... Uh, talk about leaning into tension collaboratively and I talk about that within the context of being part of a team but also reaching out to finding mentors um, or having a safe space who has that or who would like that or who says no I'm good I've got this maybe Oren I see you turn on the video <laughs> hi guys uh, yes, I'm just, I'm cooking in between, so uh, oh, yeah. nice. <laughs> double tap. This is this is another tension I mean. Uh, so uh, again, I, I didn't read the book. I, I will. Uh, I read uh, the pre your previous book, um, uh, which I find very useful, by the way. Um, and uh, and and yes, yeah, so I'm the one that uh, I think uh, I, I, I still need uh, uh, mentoring. I'm. I'm 10 years in, into product manager and product developer, yet um, every day we learn something new and every day there is um, tension that we need to, um, to address. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing 
Oren, and, and the reason why I talk about mentoring and stuff, I talk about it as a safety net. So again, especially if you're in a high pressure environment or you know you're a bit more you know, susceptible to some of these tensions, particularly, it's good to have that safety net, whether it's people around you, a mentor, you know, I'm sure it applies to lots of different roles, but particularly I find the nature of product management, we have so many, you know, context switching, flows of information like we talked about, stakeholders, products that don't do what you want them to do. What is your safety net? What's your outlet? Where can you learn? Who holds up a mirror if you if you struggle to do it yourself? You know, we, we talk about self-awareness, but sometimes you do need someone to say, you know, Phil, this is not right, or you're going down the wrong path here. Let me help you and work through that together. How do we deal with that? Do we have a safety net? Do we need a safety net? Definitely. I love the board of the directors kind of thing, like where you have uh, more people than one. Uh, mm. Like you know who to ask for like which kind of things and, and be specific about uh, what you're asking them. That's very yeah. useful. Yeah, that's your own kind of network, isn't it, of people? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Who else? Just thinking, I've done some mentoring with, um, with different people and it was always a little bit difficult for me to find specific so we had like regular, regular standing um, meetings. It was difficult to find specific things to discuss. Occasionally like I would have something specific, but sometimes you just don't. And I think maybe thinking about it from the tension perspective, it might help me a little bit to like structure these meetings potentially. Yeah. Um, and probably like from the other side as well, whoever is mentoring me, um, it might help as well. Um, just think about it a different way rather than looking into, you know, what problem do you have? Like what sort of tension you're experiencing? Yeah. Or just where, a thought. Where, where do you want to get to and what's holding you back, for instance? I think yeah. in the book, and I'm no expert, but I talk in the book about, you know, difference between coaching and mentoring, where I find often that coaching is typically more kind of almost time box where you say, I've got this particular uh, problem or this opportunity I need someone to help me work through it. Whereas mentoring is, you know, more of a longer term trusted relationship where, as you say, Dorita, the topics can, can vary quite a bit. Cool. Uh, uh, Senna, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I wanted to ask. Um, so we were talking uh, earlier on the, uh, like, re react and res respond, I guess, thing, right? So it's kind of like more the fight mode that you're like, if you're, I feel attacked, I will fight. What about people who have a freeze or flight, you know? Uh, do you like, and maybe like, I want to ask a broader uh, audience now, uh, like, do you experience that? So like, you would freeze in the moment when, uh, when something's going kind of wrong, uh, what do you do about it? Because I think that's kind of what I do. And I, later I'm like, oh, I should have said that, or, you know? I do exactly that. I do exactly the same as you. I freeze. <laughs> I'm still trying to work through it, though. I don't know. Yeah. Mark, I think it's... Oh, sorry. What? I, I was going to say, I think... Uh, oh, Mark, if you want to reply? No, 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 no. no, I was going to say, I think uh, similar to, to that saying, I don't know, right? I think it's okay maybe to, to freeze, I guess, uh, if you then tell, you know, like, let, let me come back to you, right? Or um, this is what I can tell you now, or this is what I know now, but again, right, let, let me come back to you because, yeah, I think, I think it's probably unrealistic, right, to expect that everyone will have all the time, all the right answers at the, in seconds, right? So, yeah, I think it's very okay to ask people to understand you, right? <laughs> I, I was curious, uh... If, if you don't mind, so you, you freeze in the moment, you, you, you know, I can imagine you're like almost lost for words for a moment and you're just like, mm. right? Whereas maybe Phil or I would be like, boom, we're going in there, right? Then how do you feel after that you've kind of unfrozen and you melted and you're, what, what goes through your mind after that? Then I have, a, I guess, like, then I know the way to go about it, right? Uh, later. Okay. Uh, 
And do you do anything with that once you've, again, you've had the initial freeze, you figured out, okay, this is what I could have said or could have done. Is there any follow-up to that? Yes, so, yeah, like you follow up, but some things are kind of better in the moment, I think. So like there is a part of thing that you should do in the moment, I think. And then later, like you, you cannot do it later. And the things that you can do later, I do them. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, providing, I don't know, information or uh, talking to the person. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyone else, any tips for, for Xenia about, you know, when you feel like you're, you're freezing and you still want to do something in the moment, even if it's not bulldozing, like I sometimes do in the moment. <laughs> yeah. I have a Man. joke. <laughs> <laughs> a joke can happen so, to us, when, so basically now in 2021, right? Continue 2020, since everything is done online, you just go like, um, sorry, my internet is going like really like, wonky and stuff. Like, let me get back to you in five minutes. <laughs> then you do your thinking and you get back on the call and voila. But, but, but joking aside, no pun intended, it can be quite charming to sometimes say, I don't know, or to maybe just deflect a little bit. And don't forget, that's the thing I sometimes find uh, you know, it's very easy to be impressed with other people or situations and think, oh, they know exactly what they're doing or they are very senior, so they've got all the answers. But I talk about that in the book, no one does. You know, some people are better at saying, oh, I know exactly what I'm doing. But again, I find sometimes when you are freezing or you are being a bit more vulnerable, it, it has a good impact on, on, on the people that you're dealing with as well, because they feel like, okay, that person is quite honest about not knowing the answers or being a bit anxious, which happens, right? We're all human. But I think it's very easy to think like, oh, Carlos is the CEO. I'm sure he's got all the answers and he's been doing this for 15 years. He's got it all figured out. Whereas Carlos, but we don't talk about it. But Carlos waking, wakes up every day thinking, shit, <laughs> what I'm doing, I'll make it up as we go, right? But he's not going to show you that until maybe you open up a little bit more in the moment. So. Yeah, yeah. Nice. I'm also conscious of that time. Um, and I, I guess maybe it's also good, Mark, if uh, someone wants to message you later on, right? I think you, you offer a, a virtual coffee to someone. So, Denny and I are going to go through the title, <laughs> have to make up the layout of the pages, although that, I'm not sure I can say anything sensible there. But I'm happy to. If people, you know, uh, on LinkedIn, I'm pretty responsive. And if you want to talk more, you know, just chew the fat over what we talked about your tension look any questions that you have more than happy awesome to. cool so yeah i just wanted to ask the, for the ones that have the book also to show it so then we can take a, a picture very 2020 style oh, wow um, mine's always <laughs> a kindle <laughs> wow. all right let me okay yeah someone else joining oh nice okay one Two, three. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark, for joining. And thanks, everyone, as well, for participating. And yeah, hope to see you next month as well. Thank you so much for having me. Nice thanks. to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.